Absolutely. Our okay. mission, Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting parents whose children have passed. Through support and resources offered, we aspire to help individuals become shining light parents, meaning a shift from a state of emotional heaviness to one of hopefulness and greater peace of mind. Helping Parents Heal goes a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence in a non-dogmatic way. Helping Parents Heal affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background, and encourage open dialogue. Attendance at this meeting is voluntary. We hope that participants will learn from and share with each other. Discussions here are confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Zoom meetings run by leadership are not confidential. These meetings typically feature guest presenters and are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members worldwide can watch and benefit. Neither type of helping parents heal meeting is designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers, allowing parents to learn about many possible ways to heal. This includes presenters covering progressive topics such as afterlife evidence and connecting with our children who have passed. The views expressed by our guest speakers may or may not reflect the opinions of Helping Parents Heal leaders and members, so we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome everyone who are in for a real treat tonight and thank you, Suzanne, for being here. Yes, thank you. Pleasure. We're so excited to have you here and thank you, Diane, for being on here as well. And I'm going to, as I say, read this very short bio. It's not a long one at all. Um, Suzanne J. Wilson, MA, is a carefree Arizona-based intuition educator, author, medium, and paranormal presenter. So she says carefree Arizona-based, but she hasn't been lately. Suzanne is known as the carefree medium, appearing on Coast to Coast AM, Gaia, Fox News, National Edition, and Amazon Films. With a master's degree in public affairs policy, a bachelor's degree in management, and certifications from Stanford University. Suzanne is a well-recognized researcher and educator on a wide range of paranormal topics. Her website is www.carefreemedium.com. Her books are Soul Smart and When Your Partner Doesn't Believe. She's also done videos, Life to Afterlife, I Want to Talk to the Dead, um uh, there's also a super power film that she did um as well as um a corporate video through gaia but i will go ahead and put all of that in the chat box for you and without further ado please join me and people no actually i don't want to i don't want to do that i'm going to first just say that suzanne was one of the first mediums that i met when I was on this healing journey. She actually um, turned up at the yoga studio that I was practicing in and I hadn't been doing yoga because I was so, um, I was so worried about going into Shavasana and being silent. So I was hiking it, that's all I was doing. She gave an incredible reading to the woman who was at the yoga studio without me being there, just from a picture of my three kids. And she brought through Morgan. It was the most incredible thing. And I wasn't able to speak to her for another two months, unfortunately, because her husband was going through health issues. And so I waited patiently. It wasn't patiently. I was waiting to, to be able to talk to this woman who had so much information about Morgan. And in the meantime, and I could talk forever about that reading that she gave to Angie in the yoga studio, but in the mean meantime, she went to a psychic fair here in Phoenix. She was talking to Jamie, who was a friend, and Mark Ireland was there as well. He was promoting his new book, Soul Shift, Finding Where the Dead Go, which is a book that I love and um, 
I didn't know anything about Mark at the time, but Mark also has a son who passed on a mountain, just like Morgan passed at the base camp of Mount Everest in Tibet. So he thought that it would be nice to sign this book and send it with Suzanne. So he did. Suzanne brought it for me. And um, that started a lifelong friendship with Mark. Um, it's also something that um, was very uplifting for me because to be able to see that there are other people that there were other people who were getting the same signs from their children as I was at the time in 2009 was extremely uplifting for me. So I could say a lot more, but I, um, I know you have a lot that you'd like to talk about. So let's go ahead and um, turn it over to beautiful Suzanne Wilson. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you so much for this warm welcome. And I'll just say this, this group gets bigger all the time. Being one of the people that was there from before the first meeting, I can tell you blowing up from 50 to what is it now, 30, 30 some thousand people, the need is great. And I'm so happy that all of you have found the group that you found each other and that you are coming into an awareness that it is your children on the other side of life that have orchestrated all of this fellowship, all of the sharing that you do, and that they want you to know that they meet, you meet, and sometimes it is their doing that made you meet. But if you meet and it wasn't their doing, if they didn't set it up behind the scenes, they find each other on the other side and they say, hey, I want to introduce myself. Our parents met at this meeting. So we're all in it together. That I know to be a fact. And how do I know this? I know this because it's been my life since I was a very small child to connect with the spirit world. First thing I want to tell you, I know that um, folks will email and want to get uh, appointments and things like this. My greatest hope for you is that you learn how to make your own direct connection with your beloveds in the spirit world. But I know that that takes time and practice and effort. And I just want to commend you on all the books you read, all the videos you watch, all the meditations that you do. And I want to assure you that all of this has a cumulative effect. It all adds on to your abilities and that your direct connection will unfold in the time and in the manner that's right for you. Now, the book that I wrote that Elizabeth mentioned, The Soul Smart, it, it is an ABC 123 how-to. You may or may not need that, but I mentioned that because I'm one of these people who wants instructions. <laughs> I, I want step by step by step on how to do something. And I know that there are many people like that. However, a lot of communication that happens for you is very spontaneous. A dream visit, a sign, a symbol. You're thinking of them and the favorite song or the song that you connect with your child comes on the radio. You've heard many, many speakers talk about signs, symbols, synchronicities, dream visits. The synchronicities, those freaky deaky coincidences, two different things happen that seem to be completely unrelated and let, unless, and yet they connect. And I want to assure you that it's all real. So what I want to mention a couple things. I want to talk about superposition. I want to talk about place memory. And I have some recent travel experiences where I can tell you about place memory. And all of this ties into the non-locality of consciousness, that consciousness is not in the body, that it exists outside of the body, and then tie this all together and tell you what this means to you. First off, I know there is a lot of new people. As I mentioned, I've been watching your numbers grow here from afar. And so I'll give a hopefully not boring quick overview of how I came to be, what my clients named me the carefree medium. 
It works on a couple of levels because I really do think that you can be more carefree in your life when you realize there's a part of you that's always in the spirit world, no matter what. And you know that you can develop your own intuitive abilities. But also, uh, several years ago, I relocated from Florida to Carefree, Arizona. And so I had an office and one day there was a voicemail and a fellow said, my wife and I are coming down from Canada. Here's our dates. And we want to see the carefree medium. So I went from medium Suzanne Wilson to the carefree medium. It just made sense. But that wasn't what I set out to do. And you didn't set out to be a parent who has a child that graduated ahead of you to the other side. Life has a way of getting our attention shaking things up and it's a crazy ride but what i'm going to talk about now i will be happy to take questions later as well but what i want to talk about are some things that will get you to a greater understanding of the fact that you're still with your child and so when i say child i mean son daughter children whether you have one on the other side or more than one so but i'm going to use child and i may use the pronoun he um, for simplicity's sake but i'm trying to include everybody here too i also don't distinguish between the baby on the other side and the 60 year old and believe it or not there are quite a few people in their 80s who are bereaved parents and it's it's difficult um, for them, sometimes they'll say, nobody thinks I'm a brave parent, um, I'm too old or something like that. All these people have these preconceived notions. And I've spoken about this before over the last 14 years to this group. I think it's 14 years. I don't know. We can go, you can go watch Carefree and Conscious, my episode of interviewing Elizabeth Boisson. We had a lot of helping parents heal history in there, but it's been a long time. Let's put it that way. When people say stupid things to you, like, um, I don't, you know what? I'm not going to give any examples. You know what the stupid things are. I want to encourage you to smile benevolently at them and change the subject and not take it in because you have this group, you have each other. And just remember that not only are people stupid, and I'm saying that kind of flippantly, but it's some of the things they say are really bad to a parent who has a child that's graduated to the other side. Don't internalize the silly things they say I would say bring them to the group or contact a caring listener if you need to vent about something like that. Because this is a reality when I tell you that you're still connected with your child. You're still with them. And I want to flip the script a little bit and say to you, rather than they're still with you, you are still with them. All right, so back back to me, how I got to be who I am. I wanted a normal life, but being a child, seeing colors and spirits around other people, that was not possible. And I had a big mouth, so I would tell others what I was seeing, hearing, feeling. And I got bullied at school for that, which makes a lot of sense to me now, didn't then. And so I started just getting sick to my stomach. And I realized I could miss school if I was sick. So I started faking sick a lot. And my mom, who is still, still here in the physical in her 80s, she kept trying to figure out why I didn't want to go to school and I wouldn't tell her. She enlisted the support of her dad, who was a Protestant preacher. And he took me aside and he and I were really, really tight. Uh, Friday after school, I would go to the movies or something with him. I'd be with him all day Saturday, going to the nursing homes and things like this, watching him write a sermon. And then 
get up Sunday morning, go to church, watch him preach. And then we'd all go out to lunch and then I'd go home. So I was with him every week and we're really close. So when my granddad asked me, Susie, why are you not wanting to go to school? We know you're not really sick. I told him. I told him about the colors and the lights and all of that. And to my relief and shock, he said, I see them too. That began uh, everything for me. That was a shift to now our weekends were talking about God, talking about the miracles of Jesus, talking about gifts of the Spirit. And it was really helpful, hopeful, and healing to me. I use that phrase a lot, which I understand comes from Edgar Casey, who said that whenever we're tuning into the Spirit, that our intention should be that we're doing it to be helpful, hopeful, and healing. <clears throat> but I also learned to shut up, shut your mouth, and fit in. And the day will come when you'll know what to do with these gifts. They're from God, but don't use them now, you know, unless it's you know to help you or help your family. So I put these things away for quite a while. And in adulthood, I got my bachelor's in management. I got my master's in policy. It's a, a master's in public administration and concentrated in public affairs policy. And I worked in academe as um, an admin director for a center for leadership and innovation at a university or to Stanford University, where I got some really great continuing continuing ed for the employees and got certifications there. It's all management, um, finance. I was working for uh, now a $7 billion company. I was thinking it was a $5 billion company then in a corporate HR and getting a PhD, doing a program in the weekend. So I'm not woo-woo, guys. Okay, I'm doing my thing. My family also owned uh, three wine and spirit stores in Florida. And I got my certification as a certified specialist of wine from the Society of Wine Educators. So when I tell you, I know wine and spirits, there is a double meaning. So I had all this stuff going on. And then I would go to James von Prague as one person to other teachers and I take their, their weekend and their night certification programs and very quietly practice mediumship. I went to a development circle and it wasn't until in my forties, it took a near death experience to say, look, just come out of the closet, admit this is you and give up all the corporate stuff and live this life. It just, that's a story for another day. Um, if you want to know more about that, um, if you've ever watched the Jeff Mara podcast, um, I'm on there, several other podcasts. I'm not going to get into the near-death experience. It's a whole it's a whole thing, as you can imagine. But that is what it took to get me to pay attention to, yeah, it's time to use those gifts of the Spirit. Now, you've had an, a mind-bending unquantifiable tragedy in your life. And it's now led you to the point of looking at the afterlife and looking at continuing somehow to have a relationship with your child. And I'm going to tell you that you're still with them. Yeah, they're still with you, but you're still with them. If you can make this shift over it will be one of the more, more comforting things that you can do. Let me explain. There's this superposition theory. Um, actually, the theory was, um, the, I think he called it the Copenhagen interpretation. This is Niels Bohr, the physicist, scientist, I uh, believe he, this is what got him the Nobel Prize, but he posited that all matter exists simultaneously in all of its forms. So 
I'm going to really super simplify this. I'm not a physicist. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a scientist at all. I've trained in scientific method. I, before I dropped out of my PhD program, I, uh, I learned how to do good research and it served me very, very well. But I'm, I'm not an expert, but this gives over to the thinking that if consciousness is forever, consciousness is not matter, but like matter, it can neither be created or destroyed. It simply changes form. Now I'm talking Max Planck. And if all matter exists in all of its forms simultaneously in, in superposition, and we're spiritual beings, it's not a huge stretch to take that and Einstein's theories, the theory of relativity about space-time and its existence relational to matter, it really is not a stretch to say you're in spirit right now. There's just a part of you and me and everybody watching that's on earth as well. If and it, Then if you're still in spirit in part, you're where your child is. However, the part of you that is in the physical body is having so many experiences, spiritual, mental, emotional, and especially physical. Part of why we're here, to my understanding, is to have these experiences so we can develop and grow. They talk about Earth being the classroom. I'm going to say it's the hardest PhD program in the the universe, not just the galaxy, you're on the other side too, but it's this much of you. It's the small portion of you that's there. You are with your child. You have to work to have interactions. And these interactions for now will not be of the same quality that they would be if they were also here in physical. But they exist in a non-local way, and you do too. But part of you has chosen to be local. The physicality of you is here, but you are with them. This is why dream visits can happen. Dream visits can happen because that part of you leaves more of you, more of you leaves the physical body behind in bed and gets up and goes into this other dimension, just joins that other portion of you that's already there. You can still have adventures together, but they're not going to be like their earthly adventures. A while ago, we were talking about how um, I have very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, been in Rome and I posted a picture and um, Irene commented on the picture that she and Carly had done that just about a year before Carly made her transition. And we were talking about that and uh, Elizabeth said, and now she can just go to Rome. And it's true. It, it makes absolute sense. It's true. Now, I know we would all like to remember when we wake up on the, the about those travels, but I'm going to challenge you to do something easier. I'm going to ask you to daydream. I want to ask you to take time when nobody's around. If you have to go in your car to do this, go in your car. I would say about 30 or more percent of the one-on-one -on -one sessions I do, the person's in their car, and I love it because it's like, oh, it's so cozy and the energy's all here. And I, but the main thing is, I know they won't be interrupted, right? Get some uninterrupted time and go have a daydream, and make that daydream 
as real as you can. Pick a place you want to meet. Maybe you want to start with a place that you already know. And I'm not asking you to close your eyes and meditate or listen to one of mine or somebody else's guided meditations. I want you to literally straight up daydream going someplace, meeting up someplace with your child and make it real and practice it. Just practice it. I want to ask you to just practice it. If you do this, there's a larger portion of you. This is my theory. I want you to let me know how it worked for you. But there's a larger portion of you that can be in spirit. You are literally, by using imagination, you are literally inspiring in spirit. You're inspiriting yourself to have more of yourself with them. And who knows what can happen. I've told about this many times where I've had people use my guided meditations, download them and say, it was great, nothing happened. But a couple of days later, I felt my child sitting on the bed and leaning over to give me a hug. It just opened a door. Why? They exercised the imagination. They put more of themselves in spirit. Just daydream a meeting. Keep it positive. If your thoughts start to go awry where you're feeling guilty or a little bit of nostalgia is fine, but if you're getting upset during that daydream, just call it off. Again, this is way easier than cl closing your eyes for half an hour and listening to somebody go on and talk about meeting up. Those are great. Those have their place. I want you to try something new and also let your child know, hey, I'm trying something new. I'm stretching my imagination so that more of my spirit can be with you. And one more step, whoever you talk to, I talk to God, the creator or source first, then guides angels. But whoever you talk to, ask for the gift of allowing you to open your mind and heart to have this experience. you There's a suspension of belief that's required here, but you don't have to just become um, some kind of airhead with this. You, I'm not asking you to make stuff up. I'm asking you to exercise a, an intuitive muscle and ability that you have in your intuition to visualize, imagine, simply know. See where this takes you. It can strengthen. Again, you remember earlier when I said every book you read, every practice you do, every meditation has a cumulative effect and your abilities are going to unfold in the way that they need to. That's part. This is part of that. And I want you to trust me on this and give it a shot more than once. Make notes after you do your daydreaming. You know, notice any changes in the atmosphere in the room, how you felt, how things unfolded. Did things take a turn for, you know, you went, you wanted to daydream about one place, you ended up someplace else. And if you, um, on the first time since your loved one there, something unexpected happens. Congratulations to you. That's wonderful. I would say it may take a few times, but as soon as I tell somebody it's going to take a few times, they get it on their first time. Fantastic. Write it down. And you can start to have some adventures. This also reminds me of one of your affiliate leaders. I think she's still an affiliate leader. She was on Carefree and Conscious, and my colleague Diane um, Calderon interviewed her for the show. Her name is Marie Salda in um, New Zealand and Australia. And she wrote a book called Travel the Mind. So I encourage you to look at that too. She originally wrote it for her two daughters and it was a meditation project for them. And then one daughter transitioned and they through this learned how to connect using the imagination. So if, if meditations like mine or somebody else's the guided meditation works for you, great. Just give this a try. If you're one of those people that I can't meditate 
but anybody can daydream. Give this a try. What do you have to lose? Now, next thing I'm going to talk to you about is place memory and the exercises that I've been doing. For the last three years, I've traveled. Oh, where have I traveled? I just got back from Spain, the mainland, Seville. And I was based in Mallorca for several weeks. I worked to start with and then took vacation, drove all over that island. And um, six months ago, I was in Egypt for several weeks. And I was there with William Henry, a very good friend. And also you may have seen him on Ancient Aliens and the History Channel. We were studying the connection with the afterlife in Egypt. And then I went to Istanbul after that. Um, I've also been to uh, Spain again, Portugal, um, Scotland, Ireland, and I'm sure I'm leaving uh, Mexico a few times. I'm sure I'm leaving something out in the last couple of years. Every single place I have done place memory exercises. Now I learned about this going to church when I was a child and I would lean against something and start to pick up information about things that happened in that space long ago. So you may also think of this as a psychometry um, and that's the holding of an object, sensing the moods, feelings, emotions, personality of the person who carried it, wore it, owned it. With place memory, especially if it's wood or some natural type of element in a building, by placing your hands on it, getting yourself grounded and centered, and intending to open your heart. Uh, for me, it's easy because I'm, I'm lifelong clairvoyant, but I've worked with students in retreat before, and even in my Reiki classes I used to teach, that you can start to pick up the scenes and um, some of the things that I've I've seen, I've actually heard scenes, and the one in the in Rome a couple weeks ago at the Vatican is very a very very interesting place. Standing in St. Peter's Square, putting my hands on uh, one of those posts that's out there, um, it's not just me standing there, I can pick up things standing there, but there's something about psychometrizing. I think that's how you say that <laughs> through touching um, some kind of structure that can really just, it just is electrifying to me. And I learn a lot. I can see the joys. I can see the sorrows. I can see the violence. I can see the celebrations uh, in Egypt. I could hear the singing, I could hear chanting, I could hear women singing at the Temple of Hathor. There were so many wonderful experiences. If you just stand on property or stand in a room, you may pick up everything associated with that land. If you touch the building, the organic elements in the building, things soak into the walls. I was in this one cathedral in Portugal and every, there's so much gold in there, like not gold plate, but solid gold in that place. And of course, there's so much you can't touch, but I could touch a stanchion in there. And the first thing that I saw were cherubs. And I kept thinking of the children on the other side. And as I thought of that, I saw some like a children's choir of sorts file in and they they looked at me like they're interacting and I'm like oh my gosh this is not a memory they're actually coming back because these children love to sing and every once in a while they come back into that cathedral so you can even pick up some interactive things some live things but mostly what I get are the movies that are playing Egypt as you can imagine super super interesting because you have layers and layers of history that goes way back even further 
than what we've been told. There's no way that the Sphinx or the pyramids are four or 5,000 years old, about 25,000. The geologists are looking at the erosion on the stone wall around the Sphinx. It's made by water, not time. And it took much, much longer. Well, I'm putting my hands on the Sphinx. I'm, I'm at the Sphinx with my hands on it, where a lot of people are up here cordoned off way, way up here looking down at us. And um, let's just say that there were superhumans that worked on a, a lot of this. And I did not see slave workers or any of this bogus stuff we've been taught in um, history books and by teachers. It was more about beauty and magic than slavery and um, things like that. So the world's a beautiful place. It really is. Do we have violence? Yes. Do we have challenges? Yes. But you are always with your child. You, ca you can't be taken from your child. And notice I said that the other way too. You can't be taken from your child. You're always there, but you need to allow your imagination to stretch a little bit to start to make new memories with them. And they're always available to you. Now, part of my travels in Egypt, I, I went with Diane Calderon, who's here in our audience today. And when I was in Mallorca working, she went to Madrid and she did her own tour. Um, I left several weeks later um, after being all over, driving all over Mallorca, which she'll tell you I'm a very good driver. I'm not scared of anything. I can parallel park. I can keep up with everybody. And I, my Spanish is not the greatest, but I did great. Um, we did Rome together. We did Seville together. I'm glad that we did all these parts of these trips together. I'm glad we did Egypt together because our minds were blown so big that at the end of the day, you need somebody to go, what was that? And we really helped each other through that. Um, so I'm going to encourage you, if you want to go out and do place memory, you can start local, go to a place where you haven't been before, put both hands on the wall, make sure you're grounded and centered first, open your heart, say, I'm ready to see, hear, and feel. Um, and just practice that and see what you receive. Now for connecting with your child, you can use psychometry for an object of theirs. And in fact, I would say if there's a favorite object like a ring or a teddy bear or anything, that you have it on your altar or wherever you meditate or the basket of stuff that you keep that you take out and meditate with, keep it there because their energy is so close to that object. But everything is possible. All things are possible because of the fact that you're still in the spirit world. There's just part of you here right now. And the day will come where you'll be completely in the spirit world again at your rightful time at your rightful time you'll be in that place that heavenly country where there's no sickness there's no death there's no violence there's only peace love and utter joy and so the thing i'll mention to you um when you go look online at my appointments yes i know it's bad um every once in a while a random spot will open up um, but typically it'll look like there's nothing this whole year there is a link for a wait list but what you can do is get in a small group i have small groups of seven two solid hours with me we form bonds in that small group we find synchronicities between people in the group you learn about how mediumship works and you get messages nobody's left out so this makes me feel a lot better about having a wait list, having people not being able to get in, do the small groups. <laughs> I hope that helps. And in the time that we have left, um, Elizabeth and Irene, if any of you have, either of you have questions or if there's anything in the Q&A box or anything I said, if there's something I said that offended you, um, I didn't mean to. I know 
Um, it, when you're when you feel really raw, you can be a little little prickly sometimes. I have my moments. Take it offline with me. Email me. We'll work it out. But um, I'm be interested to see what folks have to say about today. Well, first of all, I just think that it's so fascinating, the psychometry that you were doing as you were going through Europe and Egypt and all of these other places. And I also just want to remind you that we were in Spur Cross, um, very close to the, um, the pond there. And you told me to hold back. You said, wait a second, there's a group of Arcturians that are crossing. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. And I said, oh, my goodness, I couldn't see them, though. But you said, oh, they're tall and blue, and they must be in a different uh, space-time continuum because they don't necessarily see us. Yeah. But um, it was fascinating to me that you were able to do that even in a wilderness area. But... Alix also had something, Alix, my daughter, had something like this happen when we went to Corsica. And it was very soon after Morgan had transitioned. We were in a place called Philatosa, and it was prehistoric. And we were going to visit all of the different homes that were built into the mountains. And um, you could look down into the homes, or you could actually walk down in there. Um, and Alix kept telling me, Mom, I don't think those people want us to walk into their homes that she, she could see them making bread. She could see them walking around inside of the, the homes. None of us could, but it was, it was so emotional for her to think that these poor people who had been here for centuries had to have these tourists coming through and seeing the way that they lived. Wow. That that's remarkable. Listen, I was at the Coliseum 40 years ago to almost to the week that I was at the Coliseum um, the first weekend of May this year, 40 years, 40 years ago, you know, I'm a college kid and um, I, I, but even then, you know, I knew I had abilities I was so sad and so depressed and um, I got like this I don't know, like a claustrophobic feeling, but then you could walk all over the place. I was like really into the Coliseum, like where they held the people that they were forcing to fight for punishment and stuff like that. And it was like gross. So this time, 40 years later, I'm mature. I work with my abilities for decades. Now I go in and I'm like, I'm detached. And the emotion that I got was I could feel that there'd been so much healing in that place that has happened, like as people um, left their physical bodies there, that nobody left alone, that um, people didn't look back after they left there, no matter how horrible, you know, fighting to the death and things like that was. Um, there's still that feeling of the, the debauched group that would, I mean, who would watch these kinds of things, right? Um, different sensibilities than, I mean, people used to go and see violence or whatever, but, but I found that there's a lot of emotion like trapped in there, but it's residual is not connected to any violence that happened to anyone. They're great. They've moved on. It's not all ghosty and stuff like that, but I'm sure like a TV show would go out there and say, Oh, we're picking up this and that. What I found peacefulness, you know what I mean? Yes, that's beautiful. And I agree with you. I, I think that those places are some of the most peaceful now to visit. There's certainly um, so, so many people that have walked those, those uh, coliseums and, and, and of course, not all of them are bad. And um, I, I have an interesting question here. Danny is asking, when I dream of my son, is it him visiting me? or me visiting him or both? I, you know, I think that's a legit question. I'd, I'd be a little curious about there, that too. You know, you're tempted to say, who cares as long as you get the visit, oh my God. But it's an interesting thought. How about this? We're back in the unity consciousness. 
when we're astral traveling. We can be, we don't have to be. We can, with our own free will, detach and say, look, I'm just out flying around. Like I'm visiting Astral Phoenix tonight. I don't know why I would do that. It's not the greatest, but um, but we that the unity consciousness is easier for us to feel. So if you're in the unity consciousness, you're everywhere, right? So you're visiting them and they're visiting you. But um, I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, it is interesting to think about. I certainly feel like I have one foot here and one foot on the other side, just the same way that you do. Um, there's another really good question, um, but I think that you probably will be able to answer it fairly easily. Uh, what are the chances of my child coming back through her sister as my first grandchild this summer? I've been told that a couple of times. I thought it takes 100 years. Could you maybe... Um, the best way I know how to approach that is going back to the non-locality of consciousness. Like we're not confined to one place ever. We're not confined to one place when we're incarnated. We're not confined to one place in any way, shape or form. So my, my answer would be, why wouldn't it be possible? But at the same time, if it is possible then your child is still on the other side as That's well. Right. You will see your child when you get over there. We're over there as well. We just don't You're know with it. Them. You are still with your child. They are still there. Um, it, 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 you know, and it, it begs the question of, and I've had this so many times, what if my loved one reincarnates before I get there? I won't be able to be with them. It's, it's impossible. It's impossible to not be able to find someone it, it's it's impossible the the bonds can't be broken just because there isn't a physical earthly body anymore and we're not again we're not confined to one place ever beautiful so nancy is saying and i this is kind of against what we were just talking about the fact that that residual energy is not a part of the things that people experience but she said i had a similar experience while visiting a castle in northern italy where the witches had been executed in a room where oh. they were held hundreds of years ago i felt like i was being pushed to the ground with such sadness a huge weight i had to leave the room and the actual castle be before i could truly breathe again i get it i totally get it and that is a risk that you take in with place memory. I know that it you weren't necessarily putting your hands on something and trying to tune in. It just hit you. But memory seeps into wood. It seeps into stone. It, it imprints there. But that doesn't mean that there's any intelligence behind it. It's energy. We're energy. Everything is energy. Those um, people, the victims have moved on. And we get that promise to us of what leads up to our passing can be troublesome, but the passing itself and what comes after is joyous. I can tell you when I was at Colross Palace in Scotland a couple of years ago, I was in a room that they had made witch marks by the chimney. And I actually filmed this. I think it's on my Instagram. And there was a, just a sweeping cold chill that came over me when I was standing by that chimney. The witch marks were the thinking was, and they had murdered many women in this place. Also, they'd hung many women right around the corner from where I was inside. Um, the thinking was to keep the witches from coming down the chimney because they couldn't close chimneys. You'd make these certain marks, which some of them were just lines. In other places, they actually used the flower of life, some sacred geometry, and I'm not sure that they knew what they were drawing, but somebody made, said use this symbol or whatever, and that those etchings, those marks would keep the witches from coming down the chimney. Of course, we know these women were not witches trying to come down a chimney, but that's what they did. And I realized the sweeping cold that I felt didn't have an intelligence attached to it. It was the anger and um, the residual of the fear that the folks who had made those marks left 
in that room is still very disturbing, but it it wasn't anyone's suffering at that moment. Although, you know, there's always suffering somewhere, isn't there? But my point is we're tuning into sort of like the leftovers. Don't you love how we can simplify this stuff? Daydreams, leftovers, um, no one's suffering. That that's that's done, that's past. And that's why a lot of people don't seem to really want to tune in to things like this because they're afraid of what they're going to feel. So you kind of have to balance it. Like, I know that nothing can harm me and I'm willing to risk seeing um, a memory of an execution. I know it's not intelligent. No one's suffering in that moment and there's no haunting or blah, blah, blah. I'm willing to risk seeing something like that because my guides won't give it to me in detail or whatever to see the weddings that happen in that spot, to see the flowers that bloom there, to see the hear the laughter of the past. So I'm willing to, to just admit that earth isn't perfect, but there's been beauty from day one. That's beautiful. Marina is asking, what can be done to remember a dream visit or dream or a dream with your child? I know that I saw him, but I can't remember anything. So do you have any tips on maybe? Yeah, before you go to bed at night, um, go to sleep with a happy memory of something is very clear in your mind and go through it. Then go through it again you know, see the steps, the scene, whatever in your mind, and then fall asleep with that happy memory, but ask for the gift of the dream visit and the gift of remembering the dream visit. And it, it can really help to ask that. That's beautiful. Um, Renata is asking, is it more beneficial to start daydreaming using the actual memory as a starting point or to daydream a brand new place and situation uh, where to meet our, where we can meet our children. So um, I guess that this is, this goes back to what you were saying to set an intention to meet on a bench, for instance, or on a boat that you always. Yeah. It, it's what works for you. And I'm very visual. So visualizing works. When I lead a meditation, I'll say to people, visualize, imagine, or simply know that you are blah, blah, blah. Um, not everybody's super visual. If you're not super visual, start with a place where, you, where you've where you really hung out together. It could be easier to start you know, on the back porch or the living room sofa, or I would say though, make it someplace special. You know, if there was a park that you used to go to, to walk the dog or something like that, start there. Great. Oh, there you are. I thought you froze, Elizabeth. Me too, really? Yeah. Oh dear. So um, Suzanne, you had frozen a little bit, but maybe it was me who was freezing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not really sure. So did everyone hear what Suzanne had to say? Yes. Okay. Cool. Yep. I think it's a Elizabeth freezing. She's got a nice smile there. So I'm just looking at the time, Suzanne. So we have just a few minutes. Do you want to give us some closing statements, some some more words of wisdom? I could listen to you all evening. <laughs> well, that that's kind. I, I appreciate you. I could probably talk all evening too. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, it's always an honor to address those who are doing some really difficult work in their lives and who have had the courage and the self-love to reach out to others in, in a similar situation. And so I would like to say personally that I admire every one of you and I want you to know that what I do for you, you can do for yourself. And there is nothing, nothing that can happen that can really take your child away from you because you cannot be taken away from them. 
you are spirit and that is your true nature and to be patient. And I just saw a big flash of blue light that I saw objectively, meaning objective clairvoyance, like it's an object in the room. Um, the blue light is a very high frequency. And I just heard healing for all through that blue light. They said it's coming through my blue eyes. To all of you who are watching this, I've never said this before. Woo! Uh, and I've got an I've just got an electrical shock on my back. You're receiving some healing right now. They said they're sending that blue light through my blue eyes. This is a first for me. I'll just hold it for a second. And just remember that you're never alone and love truly does live forever. Thank you for having me and uh, see you online or in person in August. Yes, in August, yes. which is going to be wonderful. And everyone, if you can listen, if you can hear me, I don't know, go ahead and <laughs> unmute and say thank you and good evening to Suzanne. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Suzanne. 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 That was it amazing. was beautiful. Good night. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.